Spin me like I have already spoken, like a spoke holds its tension. Like it's together that the spokes are the invention of a wheel, that a wheel is only as round as its tension, that a wheel is a round invention. She gets on her bicycle. Hello! You are listening to Totally Spoked on CICK, 93.9 FM in Smithers, BC, otherwise known as the Gidim Den territory of the Wet'suwet'en people. I'm your host, Christine Bruce. Thanks for tuning in. Tagging along is Evelyn Perry singing She Rides. Suddenly, we're seeing bicycles everywhere. Thanks to the pandemic, in addition to all those who've been riding since forever, people around the world are pulling old bikes out of their garage or walking into bike shops for the first time since their childhood. Bike mechanics are working incredible hours, and bike shops can't keep up with demand. New bikes are being built at an accelerated rate and yet can't be produced fast enough. Enter a clever little app called Sprocket. Sprocket is the world's first bicycle marketplace app. Ready? Go get your helmet and let's set out. Million heartbeats. And I tend to miss my turn when I'm tuned into my turn The human behind this app is named Seven. He currently resides in San Francisco and has lived most of his life in Silicon Valley. Seven contacted me about doing an interview and I have to say it's shaping up to be a lot of fun. Welcome to Totally Spoke, Seven. I'm, I'm really delighted about this because I worked in software for 12 years in Toronto and I look at this and think, wow, what a bright idea. Really good on you. Yeah, the whole thing is to give back to the community and help con- connect community members so they can uh, buy and sell bikes uh, so that we can get as many people in our community cycling. Yeah, so that brings us to the first comment that I wanted to make. You, in your press release, you say there's a social good element of this, and it is Sprocket is a service created first and foremost to get as many butts in saddles as possible. I have to say I love that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the whole thing about uh, communities is they thrive uh, on interaction, and we've really taken that for granted in the last couple of decades with uh, automotive uh, society where community spaces become transitory and people don't really uh, know or care to know their neighbors and their community members or what's happening around them. And that's led to a lot of the kind of things that we're seeing in the United States with the kind of uh, uh, demagoguery that's come around. So by having uh, community members on bicycles and coming into contact with each other, even if it's a simple way, but much more than that, just being able to go slower in life and notice each other and have those conversations with people from other religions, other races, other you know jobs and roles in society, I think we can uh, build a stronger foundation for society. And that's ultimately why I'm doing this. Seven, you just made a comment that has sparked a light bulb for me. When I moved to Toronto, I'd been living most of my life in a smaller community in Ontario. And I thought it was because I was moving into a multicultural city. Toronto has everything you could possibly want. And I suddenly was faced with my racism, my homophobia, my insecurities. And I thought when I left there that the multicultural diversity had made me a more rounded person but you may have touched on something it's possible that at least a little bit uh, should be contributed to the fact that I was on a bicycle and interacting with people at a very visceral level that you do speak to people you are in a friendlier frame of mind you you see more of the community and the city from a bike than you would ever see from a car and you're not in a grumpy mood because you're not stuck in gridlock traffic so i wonder if you've just hit something for me bicycles have brought a lot of tolerance in my life yeah yeah and uh, there's a very famous picture i can't remember the artist but he's playing on a guitar and the guitar says this machine kills fascists <laughs> yes and so there's a similar thing with bicycles by uh, finding a commonality with your uh, fellow citizens, you overcome those divisive things that tend to, you know, uh, separate us rather than unite us. Very good. 
Very good. Thank you for that. I appreciate your pointing that out. It's lovely. So now there are a lot of directions we could take this, but first tell me about Sprocket. Where did you get this idea? and how to make the world a better place than I found it. Uh, and I sat around and thought about this for a good long while. I realized um, I built bicycles for friends and started to get them cycling. Like this was around uh, 2008, 2009, when the first depression happened. And uh, it was really hard to figure out the standards to put together a bike out of used parts. You don't know what seat posts go and what seat tubes. You don't know what derailers work together with what drivetrains. Uh, you know, and all of this was an impediment to this kind of like home bicycle building movement uh, that I thought would like enable people to get on bikes if they could get access to cheap bikes. So I started working on that. And I think the first idea was to build like an app that just cataloged derailers and derailer standards and told you information about derailers. Uh, because I like derailers and derailers are like beautiful pieces of engineering. And then I moved into just building a database. So you look up a bike and I built a database of like 55,000 bikes. So you can look up a bike and see all the technical specifications and know what standards follows, and then know what's compatible with it, and what you should buy or shouldn't buy, and all this. And then after I did that, people started coming up to me and going like, oh, hey, we recognize you from Instagram, or LinkedIn, or elsewhere, like a uh, bike party ride, and we know that you're the bike guy, and we know that you have this database, but hey, can you hook me up with a great deal on the $200 used bike? And I had so many of these people that were like, hey, can you help me get a cheap bike that just like, great to get me started, you know, on the road, that uh, instead of being this like hub for uh, just my close friends, I started thinking about pivoting the app into that, and I did that, and uh, thank goodness, because that worked out really well, uh, and so yeah, so, so the bicycle is now like, uh, the bike app is an international marketplace uh, for buying and selling used bikes. And you can find great deals, anything from, you know, like bikes that go for as little as $50 or people just put them up for free or bikes that, uh, you know, people want to negotiate and don't know how much it costs or they have a sum in mind uh, and you're free to make a counter offer. Uh, in fact, most recently, what I'm proud of is uh, uh, my partnership with the California Bike Coalition to make a bike registry for uh, victims of coronavirus that have become unemployed. Yeah. Touchdown! The feature there is that you can now go on our iOS app and donate a bike, and it will just appear as a as a free bike to anyone looking in the area, mm. and they can contact you. And you can decide if you know they're worth it, uh, and then you can meet up and just give them the bike. So this is an excellent avenue for people who have bikes in their garage who would otherwise just uh, trash it or throw it across the street into the bushes to connect with community members that could really use that bike. Uh, we'll take care of it, love it, maintain it, and fix it up and you know use it as their commuter vehicle or use it as their mode of transportation when they're looking for work. So you've gone from um, basically building Franken bikes to advocacy where you're giving bikes away to try and encourage people who are suffering. And that's really admirable. I mean, the Franken bikes thing is pretty awesome in itself, but... <laughs> Yeah, well, to be, to be clear, I don't do the bike stuff myself, but I connect community members. So I act as the facilitator. Sure. Because I know that there are people that uh, their biggest challenge in riding is putting on the first pedal stroke. Yeah. Right? They start thinking, oh, I want to go riding. Oh, I need to buy a bike. Oh, where do I find a bike? Yeah. Uh, how much do bikes cost? Which bikes are the right bikes to buy? Which bike is the right type of bicycle for me? And there's so many questions that these people get overwhelmed that they give up and just go buy their next car. And so my goal is to create this platform to connect them together with people in our community who ride, who can be that guide for them, uh, or to at least lower the barrier to entry so that that risk is reduced. You know, you don't have to be a lycra clad cyclist. You don't have to buy a $3,000 specialized. You can go on my app. And you can find a $200 beater from the 80s, and that can be your first bike. And that can be the bike where you learn that that bike is the wrong height for you. 
or whatever it is, right? And then you're not out three thousand dollars. And then from there you can learn and you can buy your next bike or go to an actual bike shop and find a recommendation from them. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm just that person that makes the fence a little shorter for them. Very good. You know, but you might also be connecting someone with the love of their life because sometimes people find a two hundred dollar beater bike and they just fall in love with it. lovely so on your way on your sites I see both buyers and sellers or people who want to give bikes away and and uh, and that you include both bicycles and bike parts which I think is really smart because people might have a good bike in their garage but be missing a few parts yeah uh, and that was exactly the point and that goes back to my roots you know like uh, not the humble brag building bikes in my garage and just giving them away to friends that didn't bike in order, like you said, to open their eyes to the, uh, the joy of cycling or the wonderful life hack that it is. So um, the idea there was that, you know, there might be bikes that require specific parts uh, that are hard to find. And so what the community does now is have bicycle swap meets where you show up and you get there early and then you bike with people over bins of derailers or whatever it is. Uh, the, goal here is to have us not have to board all of our parts. So whatever parts we have, we can just sell them and get rid of them and get them out of our houses. Uh, but the community members that need those parts, especially if they're unique one-of-a-kind parts that make bikes uh, all original or make bikes run again, like uh, some specialized uh, 7, 8, 9 speed Campanello drive track parts that are like impossible to find. So just uh, facilitating the uh, movement of those components is, is a goal of mine, yeah. So that goes back to your original comment about uh, how, how, how difficult it can be to put bike parts together when they don't all, they don't interact properly. So you're enabling people to find the part that they need. Yes, indeed. And uh, it's probably uh, a long ways out. I always say, you know, it's going to uh, come soon, it's going to come soon. But the ultimate goal of this is to build a really simple database. Uh, where I can say, if you have this bike, it requires these parts, and these are the people in your community within this vicinity, within this price range, that are selling these parts. Wow. Uh, that, now, that would be a really valuable tool to have around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, like, right now, there's also a lot of uh, issues with new components, uh, like which SRAM is compatible with which Campanolo and with which... Uh, Shimano, you know, and there's like when you buy a derailleur, there'll be a chart. They'll be like, it's compatible with only these years of these models of these things, and not these years of this model of this thing. And then people have to do form archaeology to really figure out, like, okay, uh, my derailleur broke, so what works with this that's not gonna, you know, leave me uh, $200 poorer without a working bike? So instead of having to go all over Google, which Google is not a really great resource for this, no. uh, is to have a specialized, um, basically a system that you can use to figure out that compatibility stuff. You know, just say, if you have this bike, then do this, or if you have this part, then it will work with these parts. So you've just enabled a huge majority of the people who have bicycles. Most people don't know how a bicycle is put together, and they don't care to know until something breaks, right? And then they care a lot. And there are a lot of bike mechanics, me included, I have bike mechanic certification, but um, I, I find it uh, mystifying how many things don't fit together or how many ways you can um, put a bike together and it, it, it doesn't quite work. So what you're doing is enabling the vast majority of cyclists out there, whether they have any certification or not, to be able to wrench a bike. Yeah, and I think the, the interesting things that are coming out of this are like uh, things I didn't even conceive of initially, but uh, 
it's also a way to earn money, right? Because you could be buying uh, bikes off of other platforms or my platform or garage sales, uh, flipping them and selling them through my app and making a little bit of money. Or uh, the people that you mentioned that don't know how bikes work, when a bike breaks if they don't want to repair it or they don't have a need for it, they can sell it uh, and they can sell it to a flipper that can repair it and then sell it. Uh, and then uh, a third thing that came up was like I had a friend going to uh, Switzerland for vacation. So like the idea is he had to pack his bike on a plane, right? Figure out how to do all that, figure out how to not get it damaged, figure out where to store it in Switzerland and then like ride it around and then just like it, it was a giant headache to be frank. So what if you could go to uh, vacation somewhere, land, buy a bike outright, so you're um, taking full ownership of you wreck it or whatever, right? And then, hey, you're flying out of the country, you sell it at a profit. Well, that's a good idea too. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I have traveled a fair bit with my bike and that would have been an, a, a nice option to have. So this now sounds like a silly question, although when I wrote it, it seemed like the question to ask. Is Sprocket popular? Yeah, we have uh, uh, 20,000 downloads on uh, Android. Uh, we have uh, thousands of bikes per se. Uh, we also partner with eBay, so if you don't find a bike uh, near you that uh, strikes your fancy, you can go look up bikes near you through eBay integration and buy one through there. Like, I honestly truly don't care if you get a bike through me as the app provider as long as you walk away with the bike. That's my ultimate goal as a service. Do you have an Instagram bicycle blog? Uh, yeah, I have a, a blog called Sprocket Blog on Instagram. It's a daily blog. It's all original. It's all my photography. It's been in existence since uh, since I started the app, so that's 2014. So I've been blogging every day, and it's uh, bikes and bike parts, always something new, something exciting. Uh, I also try to seek out really weird, crazy stuff, so I don't blog, you know, just like uh, uh, bicycle racers and uh, top end bikes. I'll bike the weird and completely bizarre stuff that I find, like bicycle cars or uh, Tour de Fat had a uh, uh, hosted by New Belgium Brewing came to the Gold Gate Park and had a Newton bike pen where there were bikes that had a uh, uh, tank tracks for wheels and shoes for wheels and, you know, bikes that you have to pedal in reverse and whatever. So, like, you know, if you're looking for an entertaining time, you should follow that blog. And, uh, you know, I, I think at this point I have uh, over 5,000 followers. So it's considered a, a micro-influencer blog. Doing pretty good. Very cool. So I, I've, I've written a book about cycling in Toronto and I found some really interesting bike uh, designs there. Um, I was particularly interested in the tall bikes. I'm sure you know what those are, right? It's the stacked frames that are welded together. So it's a little bit of a challenge to get up and down off it, but it's a totally different experience because you're up so high and you get to see such a different... You, you don't ride it for speed, you ride it for the experience, for, for the view, for the fun of it. I know a uh, frame builder in uh, San Jose that makes his own bicycles, and he uh, initiated me into tall bike riding at the San Jose Bike Party. It was after the end of the ride at the last stop, and he let me climb on it and ride around. And it was at that moment uh, that I realized it was not as difficult as it looks, and it's actually quite a bit of fun. The only challenge was a police cruiser went through the park right then, and then I was faced with this problem of how do I not crash into this or like fall over and, you know, I made it. But uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun to ride and they're also a, uh, you know, an inspiration to people that uh, aren't as involved in the community or don't ride and see a tall bike. And then that gets their imagination firing, you know, that this is like a pretty cool community. Probably the most interesting thing I've seen on uh, YouTube for tall bikes was uh, somebody made like a 12 foot tall tall bike in Los Angeles or something like that. And so their whole thing is to get on it, they have like multiple pegs on the rear. So they uh, 
and they push it up to speed and then they run after it and climb it up it before it falls over. <laughs> when they need to get off, they look for a, for a light post so they can jump and shimmy down the light post because there's just no way to like, you know, cleverly dismount this thing. Uh, and the, the ultimate uh, tour de force on this was the, the picture of them going to Venice um, Beach uh, Pier. So they have to pass under a highway and the highway is uh, 12 feet up. So you see them all riding towards the beach and then you, this sudden look of realization that like, oh crap, we don't know if this guy's gonna make it because he's about the same height as the bottom of the highway. <laughs> so he hunkers down on his handlebars and he barely clears it and the entire bike party ride just erupts in simultaneous applause. It was, it was brilliant. That's fantastic. What a great story. Thank you. I have to say that I, I love tall bikes. Uh, they're, well, they're one of my favorite designs. But have you ever seen a chandelier bike? I don't know it by name. Maybe you can describe more. So it's a bicycle that has a chandelier welded on the back. And it literally lights up so that when you ride at night, you're lit from above. <laughs> It's very elegant. So, I, will, I will say that I went to a bike party in Oakland just uh, b before the pandemic, and they had uh, a guy that had a, uh, a trailer with a speaker, like a music bike. Yes. And on that trailer, he had uh, like a fancy 1800 chandelier. Very good. Very good. It's so great to see people have this much imagination with their bicycles, isn't it? That's the thing that I love about blogging about our community is if I make an original post every day, I never run out of crazy things to show people and to talk about. That's exactly how I felt when I was writing the book. You know, I thought I would come to the end of interesting stories and I never did. Even today, here we are doing something interesting with bikes. You told me that you've lived in the Silicon Valley most of your life and I bet you have some advocacy stories. What's it been like in California, say in the past decade? Yeah, so uh, we're definitely not Copenhagen, and uh, we are making progress. Uh, California is the largest state in the Union, and one of the uh, best funded for infrastructure. Uh, however, it's also a really large state. So our major urban areas are the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, which is a conglomeration of like three cities, San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland. Uh, then we have Los Angeles, which is one of the world's mega cities, and lastly we have San Diego, which is just a giant suburban sprawl would be a good way of describing it. Um, and maybe like in 2008, when I really got involved in cycling, uh, at least my experience in San Francisco led me to believe that it's dangerous and not for everyone. So I remember waking up and racing car traffic at 30 miles an hour to get to work. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Live or let die. Yep. Uh, and since then, it has improved slowly but surely. Uh, and it's uh, exciting to see the uh, improvement of infrastructure accelerating as well. So uh, when I talk about the time when I started, uh, green bike lanes were not a legally approved piece of infrastructure in the state of California. So that's the kind of level of things that we have to overcome. Um, if you got hit by a car, it wasn't that easy to sue the driver. And now we have a three foot law in California. Oh, we very good. Three, three feet around the cyclist. That makes a whole lot of difference when you're road biking around the mountains in the Bay Area, for example. Um, we had uh, a lot of uh, pieces of bike infrastructure like uh, bike paths or bike lanes. Uh, in many cities which did not connect with each other. Right. So if you wanted to go somewhere, you would be going there and then, oh, now you're on the road with 35 mile an hour traffic, good luck. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, down the block, there'd be another bike lane waiting for you. But th that kind of stuff, you know, uh, cause problems. And the, the last thing that comes to mind is there's also um, some parts of land that are owned by cities. Uh, and there's some parts that are owned by other entities, such as Caltrans. So, like, cities can't 
uh, build improvements on that land. So an example of that is if it's a bridge in a community, right? Oh, I see. Like a bridge over a highway or a bridge under a highway or like a highway underpass. Um, or like a different thing that I ran into is uh, train tracks, right? So train right. tracks are the property of a, a train company. So in uh, Sunnydale, California, for example, in Silicon Valley, there was a grade that was orientated the wrong way and kept catching people's wheels. And like the city could take the grade and fix it because it was not on city property. So you have to go and talk to the um, train company. But nice. overall, not only are things improving, but um, like I've been going and talking to city engineers in most cities that I've lived in. And I've realized they're starving for information and uh, they value a lot of this feedback. And I've improved uh, a, lo a lot of stuff in that regard. But um, yeah, they tell me that basically in America, or at least in California, uh, the amount of improvement that they can do to a city street for cars, they feel is maxed out. So they're really looking at how they can improve a city streets in their communities, at least to the city engineers I've talked to in the places that I've lived, to be more equitable and safe for cyclists, right? Wow, like, that's a big change, isn't it? Yeah, people in cars aren't going to die because they're just going to get in a fender bender at 25 miles an hour. Right. But a family with a child in a 25 mile an hour fender bender is a serious issue for the city, right? So they're starting to think like that. Um, the other thing that's absolutely lovely is new tools that are coming out uh, in software. So there's uh, um, planning tools from Google that let them use satellite imagery to measure the lanes to right. understand if you can fit a bike lane in there or you know how streets connect or whatever, uh, and many, many other tools. Um, there are analytics tools like Strava, which is headquartered in San Francisco, provides a tool that does heat mapping for commuters. So cities can now... Uh, buy into that and then they can see you know where the high thoroughfare areas for cyclists that they need to focus allocating their budget to um yeah and just in general like if you look at uh, san francisco as a microcosm i used to live in the uh, silicon valley and go up to san francisco occasionally and feel like i was going to get murdered in a second by, by a driver because they just like felt like they had the right way and didn't care about cyclists to now where many of the streets in san francisco are like completely safe and cyclists completely respect you. Uh, uh, cars completely re respect cyclists, and it uh, uh, you know it's uh, it's comfortable to ride around San Francisco. And what's caused that change? Uh, there was some guy. Uh, I don't know his party affiliation, but he sued the city in the nineties, I believe, over the environmental impact of putting in bike infrastructure. Oh, wow. Which stopped them. They actually wanted to put in infrastructure, but it stopped them for like a good number of years, maybe maybe a decade or so. So as soon as that lawsuit was overturned, they started building like crazy. <laughs> they really empower, empower yeah, they, they're uh, city engineers to experiment and build things uh, however they need. So they'll like put in bike lanes and try them out and, you know, scrape them up if they don't work and try something new. Uh, so that's an excellent thing. And then they have a really active bike coalition. So there's there's one in Silicon Valley called the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. And there's one in San Francisco called the San Francisco Bike Coalition. And up in San Francisco, there's a lot of people that are members of that. So the money goes into cycling advocacy. And the city has responded really well to it. Uh, so much so that we have made uh, Market Street, which is the main street in kind of the center of the technological uh, economy, uh, private car free. Oh. So in San Francisco now for the majority of its length only allows buses, uh, taxis, and some other, uh, you know, uh, utility vehicles. But for the most part, it's like the highest thoroughfares injury street for cyclists. And it's now uh, limited. Okay, wait. No street cars? Uh, street cars are allowed. Yeah. Okay, okay. So they're kind of like in the bus or public transit designation. But oh. uh, yeah, so that happened. That was lovely. Uh, they're building a whole lot of cycleways. The mayor, London Breed, who was elected only a few years ago, uh, showed up to a California Bike Coalition 
anniversary dinner recently and spoke about adding 20 miles of cycleways to San Francisco and that she wants to make San Francisco really the Amsterdam of the United States. Oh, wow. So all of these are really encouraging signs. And I, I think it's not just that progress is being made, but I can definitely tell you that um, on the ground, I feel like the, the progress is accelerating. Oh, this is such lovely news. Um, the reason that I brought up the streetcars was I visited San Francisco about uh, 10, 11 years ago, and I was um, shocked at how hilly it is. So when you say that they have a strong advocacy group, a big coalition, um, I wonder at just how muscle-bound these people have to be to be able to get up and down those hills. And the way that we traveled around, I mean, um, my friend and I went up to Haight-Asbury, for instance, because we were tourists, right? This is the thing you do. And we got on the streetcar and we were going up one of the hills and it just stopped because the streetcar had physically come off the rails. And everyone literally just stepped up. They, they, all, they all got up out of their seats and went to the back of the streetcar. And we all jumped up and down until it bounced back into the rails and then we <laughs> carried on. <laughs> Right? It was so lovely. Back on, the back on the tracks, you really haven't lived the San Francisco life. How could I ever forget that memory? It was just such a lovely experience. And so, when you say they have a strong coalition, I think I I, I think I get it. But I, um, considering the landscape, I admire these people because that's got to be a challenge. So kudos to you. <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you things that that might help you. Uh, one is uh, the engineers in San Francisco have been really smart about routing uh, major thoroughways for uh, cyclists around those hills. So, mm. for example, we have something to get from um, uh, Market Street, the main street in the city, to Golden Gate Park, which is the main park in the city. Right. Uh, and it's called the Wiggle. And it literally wiggles through the neighborhood and it goes around, like, the hilly area. Wow. So something that, uh, uh, yeah, so, so they, they think about how to put an infrastructure that works not just for those of us with gears, but with families that might be on beach cruisers. Uh, the other thing I think that's an important development, and it comes in two parts, is the advent of e-bikes. Yes. So I really do believe that e-bikes are the future, and e-bikes uh, usually have a pedal assist uh, drivetrain that allows you to get up most uh, hills in San Francisco. And in fact, when I visited Seattle recently, Seattle is another hilly city. And you can see that a lot of people there are um, buying and utilizing e-bikes as well. Sure, it so makes those, a lot of sense. Those two, those two things. Uh, and then the, the, the last part of it is uh, bike share has come to these cities. And uh, bike share, such as what's provided by Lyft, Uber, and Lime, and I think it's now just like Lime and Lyft, um, they do have e-bikes in their fleet. So you can take a bike that, you know, I don't know how much it costs, like thousands of dollars, and you can rent it for like uh, a set, very small rate. And those bikes can get you a hill super easy, especially if you're a tourist just visiting our city for a short time. Wow, how forward thinking is that? I'm really impressed. Babine Animal Hospital is a CBBC accredited small animal medical and surgical facility. In addition, they provide large animal ambulatory services, including equine dentistry and bovine herd health. During the COVID-19 pandemic, staff ask that you call the facility to order any pet food, parasite treatment, or prescription medications. Pickup is between 3.30 and 4.30 p.m. only. If your pet is booked for an appointment, companions are asked to wait outside for their safety while their cat or dog is being treated in the facility. The Babine Animal Hospital also provides 24-hour emergency services seven days a week. For more information, call the Babine Animal Hospital at 250-847-8887. The Bulkley Valley Brewery was born from a need to have a great place to hang out with friends while drinking incredible beer made with fresh local ingredients. The owners and staff are skiers, boarders, fishermen, guides, and mountain bikers with five years of brewing experience behind them. During this important period of social isolation, the brewery is only open from 4 to 7 p.m. Tuesdays to Thursdays for pickups only. The brewery also does deliveries from 7 to 8 p.m. You can message us for details on Facebook at Bulkley Valley Brewery. 
You can also email us at info at bulkleyvalleybrewery.com. At Bulkley Valley Brewery, we live and love the wild and free life of Northern BC. I mean, if there's a listener-supported radio station, you're, it means that people can get daily, every day, a different way of looking at the world, not just what the corporate media want you to see, but a different picture, a different understanding, but a different picture, a different understanding. Not only can you hear it, but you can participate in it. You can add your own thoughts, you know, and you can learn something and so on. Well, that's the way, uh, well, that's the way, uh, well, that's the way uh, people become uh, human, you know. That's the way you become human participants in a in a social and political system. On her bicycle she rides. She gets on her bicycle. You're listening to Totally Spoked on CICK 93.9 FM, and I'm Christine Bruce. Before the break, a software and bike nerd named Seven was describing his nifty little online marketplace app called Sprocket. On Sprocket, you can buy and sell bikes and bike parts, and it's available globally. Next up, Seven is going to share some of his bike stories, touring around the States. One of the comments you made when we connected was that you love bikes, and one of the things that a lot of bike fanatics have in common is longer trips. Have you ever taken anything longish yourself? Last uh, two years, I biked from uh, Seattle to Tucson. Oh wow! That was uh, two thousand miles and uh, six weeks. With uh, each trip was uh, three weeks. It was a three-week trip from San Francisco to Tucson, which at that point was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and then, uh, most recently, last year, I was up in uh, Seattle for work, so I just brought my bike up on Amtrak, which is our uh, train that goes between states. Right. And then I uh, spent a week working in Seattle and the bike home. Ah, uh, I, I, I'm very jealous about cycling in Seattle. There's two reasons I've always wanted to go there. The first one is I'd love to take my bike because that Seattle, Portland, they have su- apparently such great infrastructure, but also the music scene. Like, how could you not want to go to that area, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I will say I biked on some not so good streets in Seattle. <laughs> Because I didn't realize that they paralleled some amazing bike infrastructure with two-way, like, guarded uh, bike paths. So, like, their signage could use a little work, but their infrastructure is getting uh, better. It's definitely better than San Francisco, and it's getting better and better every day. How exciting. So tell me about these long trips. I'm, I've never done one myself. Yeah. Um, so bike touring uh, <laughs> is a fun activity. It's a really great way to get to know not just your community but your country or your state um i think hemingway said it best you get to know a country by uh coasting down its uh mountains and sweating coasting down its valleys and sweating up its hills or something Um. like that uh so (laughs) for me um you know when i was in uh high school i did uh cross country running and track and field and uh, track and field, you run around in a circle. That's pretty boring. Right. Uh, Cross country, you actually get to explore because you get to run several miles or kilometers at a time, but you don't really make it a long enough distance for it to be really exploratory or engaging on that level. But with cycling, you can go, you know, 80 to 100 miles a day, so you can really make some progress. You can really see the countryside, Uh, and you can really meet some amazing people. So... Um, I got interested in cycle touring. I built my uh, own bike, and I kind of just started riding. And it started with day trips. You know, you just live in San Jose, so you go over the mountain to Santa Cruz, camp at a campsite, ride with Santa Cruz Bike Party, then return to the campsite, sleep in the morning, buy a burrito, and bike over the hill back to uh, (laughs) San Jose. So I do things like that. And that got me, you know, in, in shape and got me to understand what I needed to do for more serious trips. And I took notes, you know, like, uh, don't bring too much weight, you know, put fenders on your bike, make sure you have a triple crank. Yes. Basic stuff. And then 
uh, I started to do longer trips, which are, you know, like a uh, several day trip uh, up to San Francisco or around the Bay, or a trip over to Sacramento and back, or a trip around Sacramento, like to Nevada City, down to Folsom, and then back to uh, the Bay Area, or even a trip from like, you know, I mentioned San Jose, but like San Jose down south and then up to Santa Cruz and then back up to San Jose. Uh, so, you know, you slowly start to go from a one day ride to like a three day ride to a one week ride to a two week ride. And, and as you build up that muscle and that experience and you become less afraid, uh, you can do more. Uh, so eventually, I uh, was in San Francisco bike party, and I met this fellow from Puerto Rico who wasn't even intending to go to San Francisco bike party. He just happened to be biking past us when we all, you know, were going and joined the, the fray. So he uh, he had a like a life changing event and decided that he was going to bike from San Francisco to Patagonia. Oh Argentina. wow! Yeah, so. I said, hey, I, I have vacation coming up. Can I join you down to the border, down to San Diego? And he said, sure. So, like, in a few weeks, we met up and we made that happen. We set off from San Francisco and biked down to Los Angeles, at which point I decided that it would be uh, better because it was, it was like, around May, so it was getting pretty hot in Arizona. Yep. It would be better to cut across and just go straight from Los Angeles into Arizona. Parted ways with that guy. Met another guy... Uh, around LA from the Netherlands and I knew he was from the Netherlands because all of his stuff was orange. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I connected with that guy and he had never seen um, the American desert and it he thought it might be his last opportunity he'd like to see it so he really wanted to go through that part of the United States and he was also going to Patagonia. Wow. So, so uh, I rode with them through Arizona, and then I went back by train to San Francisco, and he also entered Mexico, and then he met up with the other guy that we met, that I started out with, and then the two of them rode around, you know, towards their goal, and then they kind of parted paths. So, anyway, it, it's kind of, uh, kind of crazy, because uh, when you're doing uh, just commuting, that's one thing, when you're doing century rides, yeah, that, that's kind of interesting. But when you have a destination in mind and you're just going and you have no idea what to expect, you don't know who you're going to stay with, you don't know who you're going to meet, you don't know what you're going to eat, mm-hmm. you know, you don't know what's going to break on your bike or whatever. It's just adventure uh, over and over. And it, it, it's uh, so exciting, it's practically indescribable. So you've just got to try it for yourself. I agree. Thank you. I've had a few people over the years tell me that I take a lot of uh, interesting risks. I'll never bungee jump, for instance, but I do take my bike to places like Istanbul, Turkey and ride in gridlock traffic because that just seems to be the important thing to do. You're, you're leaving a message and, and you're getting from A to B in a way that makes sense to you. So I don't know that I would ever say no to a trip to Patagonia. <laughs> it doesn't look like it's you know on my calendar right now but on the other hand it's the kind of thing that I really admire people who do it because you're taking the kind of risks that I think we're built for as human beings yeah and uh, uh, I think the most important thing about something like uh, bike touring is that it tempers your will right? yes you set yourself in a situation where you push yourself beyond your limits and then you come away better and stronger for it Agreed. And when things happen in your life that uh, you struggle to overcome later, you say, boy, that wasn't as difficult as biking all the way to Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I want to go back to for a minute, you were talking about your friend from Amsterdam who wanted to see the desert. Uh, it's my understanding that the desert is uh, best visited in the spring. Is that right? Is that when the time when all the flowers bloom? which I maybe should have. I just kind of did it. Uh, and that's maybe my strategy is I, uh, if I think about something too much, I'll psych myself out about it. <laughs> but if I want to do it, I know I will have a wonderful time. Um, so we went there, like I, I 
place at around May. So we just got there as it was heating up, and we got really lucky because there was a rainstorm around the Salton Sea. Oh yes. On the uh, west side of the Mojave, and it kind of cooled down the temperature through the desert. And it's only when we were about midway through the southern part of Arizona that it started to go over 100 degrees. So we got, you know, incredibly lucky. I don't know about flowers, but in Tucson was the uh, site to see the Arroyo Forest, I think it's called. Basically a cactus forest. Oh, lovely. So you go up there, and as far as your periphery can see, it's just cactuses all the way out to the horizon. Oh, fascinating. I love that. Alien landscape, unlike anything you think you could see on the planet. Yeah, yeah, and that's the kind of life I want to live, is to be able to say, wow, I saw this really neat thing. Yeah, so, each one of those cactuses are like over 200 years old. Yes. It takes like 100 years to grow out one of the arms. Yep. So they actually have laws against um, assaulting cactuses in Arizona or cutting them down. And even when we were biking along the highway, we've seen cars with like cactuses strapped to them that were carrying them probably from like one construction site to replant them somewhere else. Well, that, that redeems uh, my hope in humankind. <laughs> Just a little bit. So if someone wants to buy or sell a bike online and the demand for bikes this year makes the likelihood pretty big, where do they go to find you? Well, you could just go to the Play Store or the App Store and search Sprocket Bike App or Sprocket Bike Marketplace. You can also go to the website at sprocket.bike and there are links there to download either app, uh, as well as find me on social media. If you go to the Instagram blog that I mentioned, Sprocket blog, there's a link there to download the app. Uh, you can also find me on Pinterest at Sprocket app, on Facebook, I think also at Sprocket app, on Twitter at Sprocket blog, and on Tumblr. So, yeah, and then if you still can't find me, just send me an email, 7 at sprocket.bike, and I'll help direct you in the right direction. Seven, this has been such a charming and lovely interview. On top of it being a very functional and wonderful thing that people need right now and want so badly, they all want to get on a bike, and you're enabling that, and I can't tell you how happy I am. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's a lot of hard work that goes into it. And yes. There's, uh, there's a lot more to come. Well, all the best with it. I, I know, you know, from having worked in the software industry, how much effort goes into these things and how many uh, frustrating moments you're likely to have. But I also know that it's very reassuring and re redeeming when you see people use your app and uh, have success with the end result. And uh, I thank you from those people. Uh, I, I, I'm really, really tickled that this is happening. Thanks again. I'm glad to contribute what I can to making the world a better place. <laughs> and let's get more butts in those saddles, as you say. That's right. It all starts with a single pedal stroke. <laughs> Thank you, Seven. All the best. All right. Thank you. Have you heard of the Big Push? BIG is an acronym for Basic Income Guarantee, a movement that's gathering momentum all over the world, including Canada. Today, nearly 4 million Canadians live in poverty, a quarter of these are children. Many of those employed work multiple part-time jobs and still can't afford the most fundamental needs. A BIG provides a realistic income sufficient for life's basic needs, guaranteed by the government to all. Like universal health care, it's unconditional. The only condition is that you earned less than poverty level the previous year. What is a BIG? Well, it's like social assistance, only much, much better. Simpler to apply and administer, there's no stigma associated, and recipients maintain their autonomy. It compensates anyone doing meaningful unpaid work, like those who care for elderly family members and children, artists and activists. A BIG encourages us that our contribution is valued and enables us to contribute to the common good. Being undistracted by hunger and fear, maintaining your autonomy and dignity, and feeling entrusted with the capacity for managing your own money sensibly means that BIG recipients are more capable and therefore more likely to seek paid labor. The BIG has been proven in test communities to reduce poverty rates and health care costs. To learn more about the Big Push, visit biencanada.ca. 
Then visit bicn.nationbuilder.com and join the national campaign. Talk to friends and family. Subscribe to the supporters list of your local committee. Contact your MP and your MPP. And if you have income yourself, do donate. Ensure a basic income guarantee for everyone. Sometimes you discover an artist who makes you nostalgic. That's true for me when I hear Jonathan Davies' Sur ta Manche, which reminds me of the 60s pop I loved as a youth. Here it is for you now. Je ne veux plus une grande vedette En suivant les étapes de ta recette de succès Je ne veux pas être une crevette Bien garnie et mise sur ton assiette Puis dévorée une victime d'espérance Coupée en tranches Une tache d'innocence Sur ta manche Je me fous que je sois beau ou bête Un clochard ou bien Un écrivain réputé Mais je ne veux pas que ma vie soit une quête D'échec et d'amour En miettes abandonnées Une victime d'espérance Coupée en tranches Une tache d'innocence Sur ta manche My favorite insects is the firefly. It's so very whimsical. And so when I saw that Brett Mason had a new CD out called Fireflies, I just had to play the title track from it. Here it is. I was living a stranger's life. I let the light close its eyes. I forgot about the reason. Why? I forgot about the fireflies. Hide and seek, it's summer dusk, the blinking lights. You somehow trust. There's something about a starry night And trying to catch those fireflies Blink, blink, blink Don't go out
chased them all I caught a few Watch them fall Comes a time You don't even try You stop thinking about Jesus.